بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In 1953, Derek Bentley was sent to the gallows for the murder of a policeman. His case is one of the most controversial in British legal history, the case that has never died. Derek Bentley, along with his friend Christopher Craig, tried to break into this warehouse via the roof. They were followed onto the roof by Detective Sergeant Frederick Fairfax. I'm a police officer. Come out from behind that stack. According to the police version, Fairfax arrested Bentley. There was then a struggle. Bentley broke free and shouted to his younger accomplice, Craig. Let him have it, Chris. These five words were said to have led to the death of the police officer. At the subsequent murder trial, there was a battle to interpret these five words. The defense team argued that the words "Let him have it, Craig." should be taken literally meaning let the police officer have the gun craig give the police officer the gun craig surrender the gun craig however the prosecution argued for a wider interpretation of these words they alleged that let him have it craig was a direct order to murder the police officer let him feel your fury craig let him have all of your bullets craig these words were an incitement to murder the police officer the prosecution's interpretation won and the defendant was hanged a year later he was the last person in the uk to face capital punishment how we interpret words has life changing consequences what is most interesting about this case is that all parties looked at the same five words but came away with different interpretations likewise we may look at the same religious text and come away with different interpretations this is not always problematic but in some circumstances it has been a cause of division nowhere is this division most apparent than in the different interpretations of the attributes of allah to ala this video will explore why we interpret the attributes of allah to ala in different ways To understand different interpretations we need to take a bird's eye view approach to understand the parties involved generally we can identify two parties in interpreting the attributes of allah to ala the traditionalist and the rationalist the traditionalist is the oldest by consensus muslim and non-muslim scholarship recognize that the traditionalists dominated the first centuries of islam whereas the rationalist developed his theology on the fringes of society occasionally propped up by the muslim elites by default the traditionalist extracts the apparent meaning from the text it is not fair to call him a literalist because he relies on the context of the text he does not interpret texts in isolation the traditionalist finds it extremely difficult to dismiss authentically narrated texts if there is an apparent contradiction he will try his best to reconcile between texts most importantly once the meaning is derived and the meaning is consistent with the understanding of the first generations of muslims radiyallahu anhum he believes in it and he acts upon it even if it goes against his internal logic and reason to him revelation supersedes his limited cognition so he continuously strives to align his heart with his mind in contrast the rationalist only interprets the text apparently if it makes sense to him the text needs to align with his reason and logic no matter how apparent the text is or how authentic the text is it needs to fall in line with his conception of the divine if the text does not fall in line he will reinterpret the text or deny the apparent meaning altogether the traditionalist and rationalist are general terms these terms do not imply that the traditionalist does not use reason reason is required to apply 7th century rulings in the 21st century and to reconcile between texts and to prioritize obligations all of this requires some degree of reasoning equally the rationalist does not totally disregard revelation in favor of his reason this is absurd if he did his islam would be untenable 
Instead, the labels of the traditionalist and the rationalist indicate what is generally associated with these approaches. There is a dominant character in both of these approaches. It is easier to conceive of these approaches if we see them on a spectrum. The traditionalist is situated at one end of the spectrum and the rationalist exists at the opposite end of the spectrum. The rationalist and traditionalist are separated by genealogy. They are from two separate families. The contemporary traditionalist descends from the families of al athariya Ahl al-Hadith or Ashab al-Hadith. Regarding the rationalist, he is the child of the Mu'tazila. The child doesn't always resemble the father and may even fight with his father, but he can't escape his DNA. Sabra, the Egyptian-American historian, noted that the DNA of the Mu'tazila was shared with the Asha'ira and the Maturidiya. Their shared DNA wants to replace the passive acceptance of tradition with a state of knowledge rooted in reason. Reason is considered a higher calling than simply following what came before. The metaphor of the child was taken from Michel Foucault's impact on the study of history. Foucault was such a divisive figure that the scholars that followed him were described as his children because they either upheld his methods or they spent much of their careers trying to improve his methods. So even though they may have critiqued Foucault, they were still considered his children because they critiqued his work to improve his work, to refine it, to correct it. These children of Foucault were detached from traditional scholarship who consider Foucault's approach to the study of history as illegitimate. Traditional scholarship saw little need to refine improve or correct Foucault's work. They only refer to Foucault's work to showcase what illegitimate scholarship looked like. Likewise, the traditionalist considers much of the Mu'tazila scholarship as illegitimate. He sees little need to refine or improve what the Mu'tazila brought to the table. He considers it odious and it needs to be discarded. It is beyond repair. However, the Maturudiya and the Asha'ira sought to mend their father's faults. We see this in their treatment of everything from the Ahwal to Majaz to speculative theology. They have this incessant need to rework, revamp, repurpose and reword the ideas of the Mu'tazila. There is also a literal genealogy. Many of the early Asha'ira and the Maturidiya were either formerly from the Mu'tazila or had prior inclinations towards them. Moreover, the very same labels used by the Mu'tazila to describe the vulgar masses and their traditionalist scholars were passed on to the Asha'ira and the Maturudiya, who utilized these terms more than any other sect. <laughs> Labeling someone with a disparaging term often tells us more about the labeler than the one being labeled. James Baldwin expands on this when he documents the usage of the N-word, which is a disparaging term used to denigrate people of African descent. The N-word contains a whole range of negative stereotypes. Baldwin argues that he has never exhibited any of these negative stereotypes, yet he is constantly referred to as an N-word. So the N-word reveals more about the labeler than the one being labelled. He suggests that we turn our attention to the labeler because these disparaging terms that he uses reveals more about his own fears, his desires and his inner thoughts than he may ever express in writing. But it is there to see when we read between the lines. What is interesting about the rationalist and the traditionalist is that the terms that they use to refer to one another are remarkably consistent. Terms that have consistently been used is mushabbiha or mujassima, loosely translated as anthropomorphist. Though this phrase was used by both the rationalist and the traditionalist to describe individuals and groups that attributed human traits to the creator without qualification, the rationalist appears to have used this term far more consistently and indiscriminately. Even when the traditionalist evidences that Allah has a hand and goes to great lengths to qualify that Allah's hand does not resemble anything in the creation, or anything we can visualize, he is still labeled a mushabbaha or mujassima. The traditionalist is confounded by this because he sincerely believes that he doesn't fit the description of a mushabbaha. So we must turn our attention to the inner thoughts of the one who gave him the label. The rationalist asserts that the traditionalist is a mushabbaha because the traditionalist limits Allah to the texts of the Quran and Sunnah, whereas Allah should transcend these texts. Allah is above the description in these texts. Allah's transcendence should surpass 
whatever the traditionalist reads. The traditionalist has forsaken his rationality for the sake of these texts. If the traditionalist was thinking rationally, then he would make adjustments. But since he has not made the required adjustments, he is a mujassima, he is a mushabbiha. This reveals that the rationalist does not regard the Quran and Sunnah as definitive. The Quran and Sunnah need to be adjusted to align with one's rationality. In response, the traditionalist gathers textual and contextual evidence to prove that adjustments should not be made. This only leads to another label, al hashawiya which has multiple meanings. There is a sense that it refers to a simpleton who is unable to reason, so he resorts to hurling texts from the Quran and Sunnah at his opponent. It is interesting that the labels that the rationalist gives to the traditionalist mock the priority the traditionalist gives to revelation. To the rationalist, revelation should be a passenger, not the driver. Several etymological accounts of Hashawiyah see little difference between them and Ahlul Hadith. Nonetheless, Hashiwiya has been used in several ways. Its earliest usage in the 6th century CE reveals much about the thinking of the rationalist. Ibn Taymiyyah's etymology of Hashiwiya stated that the first documented use of the term was by a prominent Mu'tazilite who used it against Abdullah, the son of Umar. It is fitting that it was used against this individual who was regarded as the personification of prioritizing revelation. Hashiwiya also refer to the general public or to the vulgar populace or to the masses. This indicates the minority status of the classical rationalist who felt unappreciated and marginalized by traditional Muslim societies. Hashiwiya also refers to individuals who were unable to distinguish between inauthentic and authentic narrations. This usage indicates that the classical rationalist believed that content criticism is the only suitable means to judge the authenticity of narrations. It may also be a reactive word to the traditionalist's lack of respect and recognition for the Mu'tazila's attempt to develop an adjacent hadith transmission culture. Hashiwiya was also used to refer to what we would call bootlickers today due to their insistence on cherishing the Umayyad rulership. Al-Jahiv, a prominent Mu'tazilite, stated that even though the Hashiwiya say that murder is wrong, when the murderer is an unjust sultan or a disobedient prince, they do not permit anyone to criticize him, repudiate him or remove him from power. Even if this ruler threatens the righteous, starves the beggar, oppresses the weak, leaves the borders and frontiers undefended, drinks wine and sins publicly. In summary, if an individual is criticized for being anthropomorphic in a specific area, this is a fair critique. We are all capable of overstepping the bounds. But if one's entire being is labeled anthropomorphic, this is another matter entirely. Labeling is polarizing. You are either the labeler or the labeled. We need to zoom in closer to gain a deeper understanding of their interpretive process. What is most striking between the two is that the traditionalist seeks the definite, while the rationalist seeks the possible. The traditionalist grabs onto what is definite. He doesn't venture beyond what is definite. Imam Ahmed, who is the personification of the traditionalist, stated, I am not a speculative theologian. I do not agree to discuss anything unless it exists in the book of Allah or the hadith from the prophet or from his companions or from their successors. Apart from these things, any discussion of any issue is not praiseworthy. In contrast, the rationalist is willing to discuss what could be possible. He feels unrestricted to investigate the range of possibilities. Even though these possibilities are not supported by revelation or the verdicts of the first generations of Muslims, this does not deter him. He is not dissuaded from the lack of revelation because he is empowered by speculative theology. When revelation ends, speculative theology begins. Here is an example of both approaches, looking at the same text but coming away with different interpretations. The traditionalist will interpret this narration apparently and contextually. He will understand that Allah places his qadam or foot over the hellfire. However, Allah's qadam or foot does not resemble anything from the creation because of the Quranic verse, Laysa kamifli hi shay. This verse restricts the traditionalist to equate Allah's foot with anything that he has seen, experienced or can conceive of. Whereas the rationalist is horrified that this narration is interpreted literally, even when the context of the qadam 
or thought is explained, he is still disgusted by the literal interpretation. This indicates that he believes that the surface of revelation is anthropomorphic. So it is incumbent upon enlightened individuals to look for other possibilities, other interpretations, regardless if these other interpretations are supported by revelation. The rationalist theorizes that Allah will create a creature on the day of judgment and he will name it Al-Qadam. Then this creature will be sent to hell to be positioned over the hellfire. The fact that there is no revelation to support this interpretation seems unimportant. Though this type of view is placed at the extreme end of the rationalist spectrum, all rationalists are extremely frustrated with the traditionalist fixation of the definite. The fact that the traditionalists will not move one step beyond what is definite is intensely frustrating. For example, this individual is immensely frustrated with Rufamin's refusal to enter into a discussion where there is no revelation. Brothers, you've just heard Sheikh Uthaymeen saying that we believe that Allah has a real face. But if we were to be asked regarding the modality, whether it's rectangular or circular or square shaped or round, etc., whatever, then we will reply, Allah knows best. The fact that he is saying Allah knows best clearly denotes that this man believes there being a possibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's face can be any one of these shapes, rectangular, triangle, round, square, etc. What he should have rather uh, done was to deny these shapes. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we are to be asked, can Allah have a rectangular face? Can Allah have a square face, round face, etc.? Uthaymeen's job was to deny this and to reject it. Not said Allah knows best. So the fact that he has said Allah knows best shows that according to him and his likes, there is a possibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have a rectangular or square, triangle, round, flat, bloated, pumped face. Astaghfirullah. The individual did not translate the full clip, so it is important to give a summary of the context to this clip. In response to a question, Rufamin asserted that we should affirm that Allah has an actual face, but we should not indulge in any conversation about the details of what his face could possibly look like or possibly not look like. All we can say is that Allah has a face that befits his status and Allah knows best what his face looks like, echoing the sentiment of Iman Ahmed. It is not praiseworthy to entertain such a discussion because we have no revelation to support such a discussion. This is the safest position to take because every step you take needs to be guided by revelation. A crude comparison would be when we say no comment in legal matters. This may seem like an admittance of guilt, but most legal advice will tell you to refrain from talking, even if you are innocent. Say no comment. Even when absurdities and accusations are thrown at you, say no comment because this is the safest path. Nonetheless, I can see why the individual is so frustrated. I can see why he believes that Rufamin's refusal to discuss the issue is an indication that Rufamin believes that Allah's face is a triangle or that it is possibly a triangle. This is because refusal to discuss an issue is a foreign concept to the rationalist. The rationalist is accustomed to discussing the law with no revelation and even deriving general principles from sources outside of revelation. He has developed an entire field called negative theology where Allah is discussed with no specific connection to any text. Allah is not inside the world. Allah is not outside the world. Allah's attributes are not him and his attributes are not other than him. Allah does not move. Allah is not still. You will see paragraphs upon paragraphs of this type of negative discourse with no specific reference to revelation. Moreover, such negativity goes against the spirit of revelation. Allah affirms much more about himself than he denies about himself. So this individual's background in negative theology was why he was unable to comprehend Rufamin's perspective and why he was adamant that Rufamin was hiding something. Nonetheless, 
I suspect the main reason this individual is frustrated is because Uthameen affirmed an actual face. Everything else seems to be window dressing. He spent much of the video saying what Allah's face isn't, but he never affirmed what Allah's face is. This is very important. Many miss this point. What does Waj mean? If it does not mean face, what does it mean? He is wise not to reveal his real position because he will reveal his Mu'tazila DNA. And also, he doesn't want to openly deny an attribute of Allah. It is no longer acceptable to do this in the public space. A metaphor that describes the rationalist and traditionalist would be that they were both given a warm cabin in the middle of winter. This cabin was designed to protect them against the elements. This cabin was equipped with everything they needed. However, the rationalist was not satisfied with the arrangement. He decided that he wanted more. He wanted to leave the warm confines of the cabin and head out into the wilderness to bring back more supplies. The traditionalist pleaded with him not to venture out into the treacherous arctic winds. Their cabins had sufficient provisions. It had all they needed. The rationalist dismissed his pleas and ventured out. Every now and again, the rationalist taps on the cabin's window to ask the traditionalist to join him in his search. The traditionalist flatly refuses. Seeing the desperate state of the cold and embattled rationalist, only strengthens his resolve. On the surface, the rationalist seems to be the brave one of the two. He is courageous and spirited by heading out into the unknown. Whereas the traditionalist seems simple, domesticated, dogmatic. It is these labels that the traditionalist has always had to contend with. Nonetheless, when the rationalist seeks to tamper with the integrity of this warm cabin, the traditionalist comes rushing out to its defense. In other words, when revelation is being challenged or denied, the traditionalist has little choice but to come out of his comfort zone to address it. He is now compelled to speak explicitly about matters that he would rather leave unspoken. For example, he would rather just say Allah spoke to Musa and leave it at that. But when the rationalist argued that Allah only speaks within himself or that Allah does not speak, someone like Iman Bukhari is compelled to add Allah speaks with sound. Bukhari clarifies that sound is not comparable to anything that we have seen or anything that we can imagine. With sound is implied in Allah spoke but it was not articulated explicitly because what was understood did not need to be explained. The rationalist regards such explicit language as crude, vulgar and overstepping the bounds. And on occasion, he is not wrong. But what he fails to acknowledge is that such language was prompted by his controversies, by alleging that Allah does not hear, Allah does not see, Allah does not speak, Allah did not ascend over the throne, the Quran is created and so on. The rationalist forces the hand of the traditionalist. The traditionalist is typified by viewing Allah as being more accessible than his rationalist counterpart. To the traditionalist, Allah is accessible because he revealed something about himself to us. Through such means, we can have an intimate relationship with our Lord. Thus, it is inconceivable to the traditionalist that the Quranic verses and prophetic narrations that mention the attributes of Allah should be relegated to the mutashabihat. This would mean that most of the Quran and Sunnah are unintelligible. Moreover, the traditionalist regards anthropomorphism as kufr. Thus, it is implausible to the traditionalist that the ordinary reading of the Quran and Sunnah is kufr. Yes, on occasion, an apparent reading would be problematic, but to categorize most of the Quran and Sunnah in this fashion is extreme and untenable. Such rationalization of revelation distances one from experiencing its full impact. It is difficult to access its sweetness and indeed it's horror if there is so much red tape placed between you and the text. For example, the ordinary meaning of the Qadam that will be placed over the fire, sealing the fate of the inhabitants of hell forever, fills you with dread, fills you with abject horror. You can almost feel the darkness of that encounter. Similarly, knowing that Allah created Adam with his two hands assures us of the care and attention that Allah gives to his creations. Saying Allah created us with his two powers or that his two hands are empty words only causes us confusion and does not give us that same warmth. Or when you take the apparent meaning that Allah spoke to Musa, you can feel the directness and intimacy. But if you take the rationalist approach that Musa did not hear Allah's speech in an ordinary act of hearing, but instead Musa experienced it coming from every direction and perceived by every one of his organs, you lose something. It is too removed from one's experience.
the further you go down the rationalist spectrum, Allah becomes more and more inaccessible, more and more abstract, until there is essentially nothing over the throne. Many of Allah's attributes are denied, explained away, or reinterpreted. So most of the rationalist discourse is about what Allah isn't, and there is very little discussion about what Allah is. The rationalist appears to agree with skeptics and agnostics, who also affirm that their creation came about by something that is unknowable. Since Allah is considered ineffable, unintelligible, and impossible to grasp in normal circumstances, one needs to alter his mental state through chanting, inducing trances, meditation, or elaborate group ceremonies to gain a glimpse of the divine. These activities help him reach an elevated plane to access the divine or gain union with the divine. The rationalist has little choice but to go down this road because abstraction can never produce a meaningful connection. There needs to be some relationship between the concrete and the abstract. Even if this relationship is at the surface level, when we cease to describe Allah how he described himself, we literally do not know who or what we are talking about. The rationalist soon realized that the more he makes Allah inaccessible, the greater the void he has to fill. So he filled this void with shrine worship, deification of saints, elaborate festivals and innovative practices to connect with the divine. All of these activities are a means to make God real. Going back to our metaphor, when the rationalist stepped away from the warmth of the cabin, he was left to feel the coldness, desolation and emptiness of disconnection. We all need to feel the warmth. We all need to feel connected to something. We cannot survive outside for too long. So the rationalist has to innovate. He has to look for something, anything to make a fire, but his fire pales in comparison to the warmth of the cabin. Typically, the traditionalist does not engage in any of these innovative activities to connect with his Lord, because to him, Allah is already accessible through his descriptions of himself. Though these descriptions are at the surface level, they are sufficient for him to have a personal relationship with his Lord without the need to fill a void. To the rationalist, Allah's inaccessibility is due to the Quranic verse, Laysa kamifli hi shay. But this is inconsistent because there are a select number of attributes that they do affirm, even though these select attributes are shared with humans. So why is the hand of Allah denied, but the hearing of Allah is affirmed? Why is the foot of Allah denied, but the seeing of Allah is affirmed? The way in which Laysa kamifli hi shay is used to distinguish Allah's sight from our sight should be used to distinguish between Allah's thought and our thought. Why is affirming Allah's sight not considered anthropomorphism when Allah himself stated that hearing and seeing are human qualities? Why is describing Allah as compassionate and merciful not considered anthropomorphic when Allah himself said that humans have qualities of compassion and mercy? Moreover, we only know what mercy, compassion, sight and hearing are because we have experienced them. There is no frame of reference for them other than our direct human human experience. Therefore, this leads us to ponder another reason for the rationalist's insistence on denying or reinterpreting some of Allah's attributes. The reason appears to be that the attributes of Allah are seen through the lens of philosophy. The rationalist's use of philosophy acts like a filter when he reads Revelation. Philosophy filters what is reasonable to believe and what is unreasonable to believe. More specifically, there is a philosophical principle that states that God is an inaccessible object of knowledge, meaning God's essence cannot be known. It can only be known through a select group of actions. Thus, there is a tendency for the rationalist to affirm some of Allah's actions, but he very rarely affirms Allah's essence. This is because he believed that Allah's essence is so unknowable that negation is preferable to affirmation. Simply put, the rationalist finds it easier to affirm Allah's act of creating than affirm Allah's hand. The philosophical principles adopted by the rationalist were excessively anti-anthropomorphist because these principles were developed in polytheistic societies that practice a gross and vulgar form of anthropomorphism. The gods in these societies committed despicable acts. These gods contested with other gods and were even vulnerable to human attacks. This drew significant criticism from Xenophanes and others who disputed the unbefitting and abhorrent anthropomorphic descriptions of the gods. Greek philosophers were faced with a choice. They could either abandon the belief in gods 
or they could develop new theologies. They chose to develop new theologies. The problem is the philosophers were not guided by revelation, so they went too far in the opposite direction. God became inaccessible, incorporeal, invisible, and in some sense, unreal. These philosophies were enthusiastically used by Jews and Christians whose religious books had been contaminated with crude anthropomorphic tales. So we can understand why these previous nations needed to adopt these anti-anthropomorphic philosophies. No such excuse is available to the Muslims. The Muslims have a safety clause to repel such crude anthropomorphism. This verse acts as a dam, preventing a deluge of vulgar anthropomorphism. This verse distinguishes a law from his creation when they share the same linguistic designation. In summary, there are age-old philosophical principles buried deep into speculative theology, guiding the rationalist to choose the possible over the definite, and to choose inaccessible over the accessible. Listen carefully to the logic. Whenever the rationalist presents a different interpretation from the traditionalist, you will hear traces of philosophical thought. It is subtle, but it can be recognized. For example, when Abu Hanifa was asked about the relationship between between bodies and incidental attributes. He immediately recognized a philosophical principle. He then warned the questioner to steer clear of such matters. Likewise, Ibn Khaldun recognized that the belief that Allah is not inside the world nor outside the world is derived from philosophy. Also, there's a very interesting Christian account written in the late 8th century CE in which Cyril, the apostle of the Slavs, was sent to the Middle East to debate with Arab Muslims on questions of theology and philosophy. Cyril made an interesting analogy about his meeting with these Muslims. He said that they boasted about possessing a rare liquid, but in actuality, their rare liquid was merely seawater. What Cyril meant by this is that they seem prideful about their development of theology, but in reality, most of what they developed were general philosophical principles that were widely available to Europeans. It was as common as seawater. Are the attributes mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah meaningful or meaningless? The traditionalist argues that they are meaningful to us, whereas the rationalist argues that most of the attributes mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah are meaningless to us. Very few individuals would outright reject the meaning of Allah's attributes. Instead, they may uphold Allah's attributes, but the meaning of the attribute is deemed unknowable to human beings. Only Allah knows the meaning. For example, he will say openly that Allah has a yad, but thereafter will claim that the meaning of yad is unknowable to humans. So for all intents and purposes, the word yad is emptied of any meaning or significance. We are told that the word yad should mean nothing to us. Once yad is emptied of meaning, it is essentially just the sound. The rationalist insistence that we should render such words mean meaningless would be plausible if these words had no prior meaning but they had meaning which was ma'loom which was known to us it would also be plausible if these meaningless words were placed in a separate section but it becomes untenable when these so-called meaningless words are placed in the middle of sentences these so-called meaningless words play an active part in a sentence. Without these meaningless words, the sentence would not make sense. Strangely, these meaningless words follow normal grammatical rules. Strangely, these meaningless words are used in sentences that convey information to us. Strangely, these meaningless words are found in the middle of conversations between the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, and even his conversations with non-Muslims, where it becomes even more problematic is that the rationalist informs us that not all of Allah's names and attributes are emptied of meaning. Some are knowable to humans. This creates another problem. How do we distinguish between attributes that are knowable and those that are unknowable? Or how do we distinguish between metaphor and literal attributes? If the inability to distinguish results in anthropomorphism, then it is troubling that we were given no criteria of distinction by the Prophet wasallam. Very troubling. If one argues that he was somehow intrinsically known by the early Muslims, so that there was no need for the Prophet wasallam to provide any criteria, we would still 
still expect to see explicit instructions or commentary to educate the surge of new and highly literate foreign converts from anthropomorphic religions. Some of these new converts were unfamiliar with Arabic, Arabic culture and this new religion, yet we do not see such instructions to help these new learners to distinguish between the knowable from the unknowable or between the metaphor from the literal. All we were given were texts that tell us that the caif of Allah's attributes is unknowable to humans. The caif of Allah's attributes and meaning of Allah's attributes are not the same thing. Caif can be translated as the how of Allah's attributes or the manner of Allah's attributes or the mold of Allah's attributes or the nature of Allah's attributes or the details of Allah's attributes. Since there are no texts that tell us that Allah's attributes are meaningless to humans, the rationalist claims that the texts that tell us not to investigate the caif essentially mean that we should treat Allah's attributes as meaningless. This is incorrect. The general meaning of a word does not have to include the caif of the word. We may know the general meaning of money, but we may not know the caif of money. How is money accumulated? What does money feel like? What colour is the money? What does the money smell like? What is the money made from? None of these kafia are found in the meaning. It takes further investigation to find out. Moreover, the fact that we were instructed to only investigate the kaif indicates that the ordinary meaning of the text was expected because kaif follows the meaning. The first step is to know the meaning of the word. The next step is to find out the kaif of the word. It is this second step that has been prohibited, not the first step. The rationalist rejection of meaning is due to his overthinking and overanalysis. Knowing the meaning of a word does not require such deep contemplation. Meanings are not always comprehensive. It is just surface level. The meanings that we have for Allah's attributes are merely hints of his magnitude. Chomsky, a renowned linguist, expands on this. What we call definitions are not definitions. They're just hints. If you take the Oxford English Dictionary, you know, exactly. the one you read with a magnifying glass, uh, and they give you a long detailed thing which they call the definition of a word. In fact, it's very far from a definition of a word. It's a few hints that a person who already knows the concept can use to understand what's going on. Meaning is more of a hint than a comprehensive definition. Meaning or ma'ana in Arabic translates as the sense of something, the spirit of a thing, notion. Even the English word for meaning originally meant a sense of something. This is why Imam Malik off-repeated statement is so significant. When he was asked about the istiwa, he said that the word istiwa was known by all. We all have a sense of it. We all have a notion of it. We all have a hint of of it. But we should not seek to define istiwa comprehensively. We have all been endowed with a sense of these words. That is enough for us. We should not investigate any further. Pass over these words as they come without investigation. We should stay inside the warm cabin. There is also an abstract nature to words that many of us are unaware of. It is very subtle. Even though our words are rooted in our concrete realities, there is a degree of abstraction that allows us to use these same words in different contexts. For example, this is my drawing of a house. 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 What is interesting about this example is that there is no comprehensive definition that unites all of these drawings. Some houses were square. Some were a triangle, some were a circle, some had windows, some had doors, some had roofs, some had chimneys, some were coloured. Applying the term house to all these variations would not be possible if words were not able to be abstracted. And you think about how children draw houses too. Pentagon, rectangle, what is it, trapezoid? Chimney, almost always with smoke, which is quite interesting. It's, it, I don't know where kids get that exactly, but they almost always draw a chimney with smoke even though chimneys with smoke aren't that common anymore. But anyways, you know, you, you can see what a child's picture of a house looks like in your imagination. One of the things that you might want to think about is that is not a picture of a house at all, right? It's an iconic representation that's kind of like a hieroglyph because no house looks like that. And then you think about how a child will draw a person. Circle, stick, 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 stick. And you show it to someone and they go, that's a person. It's like, really? 
It looks nothing like a person, right? It, I mean, you, you immediately recognize it as a person, but it looks nothing like a person. Granted, this is a very crude and basic exercise, but it demonstrates that even children have the ability to abstract. Since our societies are so image-driven, some might be under the illusion that it is not possible to separate the image from conception. But we do this all the time, even without knowing it. We have the capacity to go beyond the image and maintain background imageless conceptions of Allah's attributes. But if we don't, this is akin to an intellectual autism. One of the problems with autistic people, and they have a very difficult time uh, developing language, by the way, is that they can't abstract out a generalized representation across a set of entities. They can't abstract. The rationalist refuses to interpret Allah's attributes abstractly. He insists that Allah's descriptions can only, only be understood anthropomorphically. When the traditionalist states that Allah has a face, the traditionalist leaves the statement like this. It is abstract. It is a mere hint. This concept of the face is not related to anything. But in order for the rationalist to refute this statement, he cannot leave the statement like this. It is too abstract. He has to add, they say Allah has a face like the creation. Like the creation. The rationalist feels obliged to point out that the face is only for creation and no other concept of the face is possible. This is interesting. The rationalist is actually proving that Allah has a face is an abstract statement because the only way for the rationalist to refute the statement is to add the words like the creation. He has to qualify this statement. He can't leave the statement as it is. This statement can't be refuted as it is. The rationalist needs to add the words like the creation or insinuate that this statement refers to a human face. In other words, the rationalist needs to move this statement from the abstract towards anthropomorphism before he can refute it. Even though there is nothing in this abstract statement that indicates anthropomorphism, even though the individual that made this statement did not intend anthropomorphism, none of this matters. Also, the rationalist cannot leave the statement as it is, because if he were to refute this statement as it is, it would be seen as an outright denial of Allah's attributes. It would be too controversial for the rationalist in 2023 to explicitly and publicly deny an attribute of Allah oft repeated in the Quran and Sunnah. The rationalist cannot say Allah has not got a face. He cannot say this. He could only say Allah has not got a human face. He needs to add words or insinuate that what is meant is a human face. Essentially, he needs to put words into the mouth of his opponent, regardless if his opponent actually said or intended these words. This is regarded as a straw man argument. For example, when the traditionalist affirms that Allah descends in the last third of the night, the rationalist argues that Allah does not move up and down like a yo-yo. The traditionalist did not state or believe that Allah moves up and down in this fashion. The rationalist is putting words into the mouth of the traditionalist. The traditionalist merely affirms that Allah descends in the last third of the night. That is it. End of statement. The traditionalist affirms that Allah is above us. The rationalist replies that Allah does not have a location. To the traditionalist, this is a strange argument because he did not say or imply that Allah has a location or a place or an area. One person sees W and the other person sees M. The traditionalist is saying something, the rationalist is hearing something else. I was always puzzled, why is this the case? But then I heard the reasoning. يعني مثلا نحن عندما نقول عن المجسمة أنهم يعبدون صنما المقصود أنهم تخيلوا ذات المولى جل, جلال جل جلاله تخيلوه كأنه جسم وأجروا عليه أحكام الجسم لكنهم هم يعبدون الله تعالى لا يعبدون أصناما فعندما نقول نحن عن المجسمة إنهم يعبدون صنما أي أنهم بقولهم هذا uh, now I understand why the rationalist hears something else. Because when the traditionalist makes a statement, the rationalist immediately thinks about what naturally follows from this statement or what is the logical conclusion of this statement. To the rationalist, it follows from the statement that if Allah is above us, this would mean that Allah has a location. This is the logical conclusion for whoever asserts that Allah is above them. Whatever is above us, 
house must have a location. Surely it is as if the rationalist carries on the thought process of the traditionalist even after the traditionalist stops talking. Carrying on the thought process of your opponent is problematic for four reasons. First, we have to be fair. If we are to condemn an individual, it must be for his words and his words alone. We cannot carry on the thought process or put words into his mouth if he neither uttered those words nor intended those words. Second, stating the logical conclusion of one's statement may be acceptable when discussing our world. One plus one is usually two. The kefir of our world follows a typical pattern. We can almost predict the logical conclusions of our actions, but the use of logical conclusions is irrelevant when talking about the entity that created our world. For example, if Allah descends to the lowest heaven, the logical conclusion would mean Allah descends beneath his throne and has entered creation. But this logical conclusion alludes to the kefir of Allah. We have now stepped into a prohibited area. Moreover, this is an area that is well beyond our comprehension. We cannot fathom Allah's kefir. Our limited cognition would make his kefir nonsensical to us. Third, applying our logical conclusions to Allah is tantamount to anthropomorphism because our logical conclusions are developed by what we see what we hear, what we experience in this world. When we throw a ball in the air, it goes up, then comes back down. What goes up? Must come down. Cause and? Effect. Action. Reaction. Push. Pull. And so on. All these norms are particular to our experience in this world. Our logical conclusions are so tainted by our realities in this world that whatever we deduce about Allah will be a reflection of what we have experienced in this world. Fourth, even when our logical conclusions are derived from scientific inquiry, they are still unsuitable for applying to the Lord of the worlds. The rationalist has a somewhat outdated mechanistic understanding of the world. This is because his speculative theology was developed in a period when the natural sciences were wedded to philosophy. However, as scientific inquiry disentangled itself from its philosophical roots, speculative theology has failed to update its simplistic and mechanistic understanding of the world. The rationalist overestimates how much his reasoning and senses can tell him about the world, whereas the various sciences have moved on considerably to the extent that there is an acknowledgement that there isn't a single effect in nature that can be fully comprehended. Although the world may seem like it works mechanically, and predictably. There is an acknowledgement that there is a ghost in the machine. There are unknown forces which are beyond our comprehension, even in the most simple phenomena. Uh, Newton showed that the world just isn't a machine. Uh, it works by mystical forces. Uh, that was an appalling discovery. It, uh, Newton considered it a total absurdity uh, and to the end of his life tried to overcome it, but it was apparently true. Uh, namely, the force of attraction is has no, and does not involve contact. Uh, and that's just the way the world works. It has mystical forces. Uh, as I say, Newton was regarded this as a total absurdity. He was sharply condemned by the scientists of the day, the leading scientists of the day, for returning to neoscholastic mysticism uh, with uh, occult forces, as they were called, that uh, uh, made the world work. Uh, so the, and showed that the world couldn't possibly be a machine. And these were unintelligible forces. We couldn't understand them. They were mysterious. I mean, common sense tells us that I can only make something move by touching it, by being in contact with it in some fashion. But Newtonian physics said, no, that's not true. There's an occult force that uh, allows you to make things move and that accounts for the terrestrial motion and planetary motion and the tides and so on and so forth. Well, as I say, this was considered a total absurdity, but it was apparently true. Uh, and what it does is demolish the conception of body. It demolishes the idea that uh, the world is a machine. It isn't. It has mystical forces. So that goal was undermined. It turns out the world is indeed unintelligible to us. We have to accept the existence of mystical forces. We can try to construct, develop an understanding of their principles, and doctrines about them, and so on but they're not intelligible to human understanding, it was, a, like I, as I say, a kind of an outrageous discovery. Newton tried to overcome it to the end of his days. Uh, into the, well into the 20th century, physicists were still trying to construct some kind of mechanical conception of the universe. By now, that's finally been abandoned totally, and uh, people are accustomed to even more mystical notions like 
you know, fields, which are mathematical objects, but still interact with one another, uh, electromagnetic forces, uh, you know, uh, a conception of space and time, which eliminates any notion of solidity or, uh, you know, uh, in fact, every all of common sense is just gone. It's not even a, it's not even a, it's not even considered relevant at this point. What is pertinent about this acknowledgement is that it refers to the phenomena in this world. So even in this world, logical conclusions are not always accurate. So what about when they are used with our Lord? Moreover, as Muslims, we believe that there are phenomena happening right now that are beyond our logical conclusions. Angels are recording our deeds. Jinn may be passing around us. Graveyards are filled with screaming and shrieking inhabitants. We are exposed to very little in this world. So it is perplexing why the rationalist assumes that the entity that created these phenomena would neatly fit into his logical conclusions. The rationalist appears to be repulsed by certain attributes like the face, hands, shin, foot. It is almost as if he considers these attributes a disability or a defect. Why does the concept of a face, the concept of a hand, the concept of a shin, the concept of a foot prompt such repulsion? They are noble attributes. Unfortunately, we often take for granted the things that deserve the most gratitude until they weaken or are removed from us. When someone without hands sees your hands, he sees them as a godsend. He sees them as divine. He is in awe. There is someone right now praying, crying, pleading with his Lord to have the very attributes that you are repulsed by. Be very careful when you talk mockingly about these attributes that you take for granted. They can be taken from you. Then you'll be painfully aware of how Allah has honored human beings with these attributes. The rationalist may retort that he is not repulsed by attributes in and of themselves, but he is repulsed by the fact that they are human attributes which are not befitting Allah. This response is problematic because the rationalist sees no issue affirming hearing, seeing, power, mercy, which are also human attributes attributes that can only be understood through our experiences. We cannot envision these conceptions without directly comparing it to something that we have experienced in our lives. It may be argued that it is easier to abstract our non-physical attributes like power, sight and hearing as opposed to our physical attributes like hands and face. This is not necessarily true because these non-physical attributes do not exist only in our heads. We express their meaning through our physical bodies. In fact, we can only comprehend them through the actions of our physical bodies. For example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described Allah's mercy by pointing to a woman that he saw caring and nursing children in reaction to a companion reciting a Quranic verse that mentioned Allah hearing and seeing all things. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam placed his thumb on his ear to indicate Allah's hearing and he placed his finger on his eye to indicate Allah's seeing. In spite of all we have mentioned, the rationalist may still find it too difficult to affirm certain attributes. However, what is the alternative? It appears that the alternative path is even more difficult to comprehend. The masters of the field talked about the difficulties of pursuing the rational path, the difficulties of understanding the concepts of speculative theology, the difficulties of negative theology. If it is difficult for these masters to understand these concepts, then what hope is there for the common man? Therefore, there were warnings from these masters not to discuss these alternative avenues with the common people. The common people were simply not understand and it may even lead to disbelief. When one is faced with the difficulty of believing in a matter that goes against one's rationality, the words of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu come to mind. Abu Bakr was approached by individuals who had renounced their faith due to their disbelief in a prophet's ascension into the heavens. It was just too irrational for them to believe a man could travel such a vast distance in such a short space of time. In reply to them, Abu Bakr said something profound. Verity I believe. What is even more astonishing than that, I believe that he has received messages from heaven for everything he does. Abu Bakr set the bar with this statement. Whatever we have trouble accepting, it pales in comparison to the belief that a supreme deity relayed information to a non-human entity who then transmitted that information to a 40-year-old unlettered man. Once this is believed, everything else is far less difficult.
From past civilizations, we can still hear echoes of the clashes between the rationalist and the traditionalist. For example, the Jerusalem church, which consisted of the family and disciples of Jesus, was established to uphold the letter of the law and maintain a distinctly monotheistic and Jewish way of life. The Jerusalem church was the epitome of traditionalism. However, it clashed with the Pauline church, which adopted a more rational approach. The Pauline church did not accept the authority of the Jerusalem church. They regarded the church as inferior and unenlightened. They opposed its legalistic focus. Instead, they inclined towards ta'wil or allegorical interpretation of the scriptures. They were also open to sources outside of the scriptures, such as Stoic philosophy and Greek mystery religion. Throughout history, we can observe the disastrous consequences on relying upon one's rationality. When Noah told his son to embark on the ark, his son rationalized that he would seek refuge from the rising water levels by climbing to the top of the mountain. Needless to say, he succumbed to the flood. We hear about the obstinance of peoples that Allah gave specific instructions to. They would reinterpret these instructions to suit their internal logic. Or when instructions were given, they pondered over the nature of these instructions and kept asking for greater clarity. But what we don't hear is that generations past were punished because they upheld Allah's instructions to the letter.